I'm Anthony Davis from The Weekend Show. There is a frustration with the mainstream media, with their failure to cover Donald Trump properly. They certainly contributed to his rise the first time around, and now, this time, they seem to be failing yet again. In my interview on The Weekend Show, just gone with Jared Yates Sexton, we try to get to the bottom of why the media is failing America. Why is it that this very obvious thing isn't getting more play? And occasionally there would be moments where, and I'm sure you remember these, I'm sure your viewers do as well, there'd be articles like in the New York Times or the Post that would be like, is Donald Trump a threat to democracy? Yeah. Question mark? Yeah. Should we right. be calling it fascism? Should we be calling it yeah. fascism? Yeah. And also, you know, we brought up January 6th earlier. I, I don't know if people remember this because it's, it's, it's a very upsetting thing. We all watched an attempted coup play out live on television in front of the entire world. And for a few hours, it seemed like everybody understood what was going on. And within 24 hours, major pundits and journalists were like, I don't think what we saw actually happened. I I don't think it was as bad as we thought it was. Yeah, it was tourists. And I I think a lot of what has happened, uh, it it can be broken down into a, a couple of key points. One is that our media, as much as they despise Donald Trump, and they do, they are addicted to him to no end. Our, our media, our economy is wired for self-destruction. We need to keep people terrified. We need to keep them anxious, but we also need to keep them tuning in. And Donald Trump is the biggest gift that the media has ever had. Um, he, he, you know, occasionally Donald Trump tells the truth by accident. And one of the things that he told the truth about was when he said the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the media absolutely loved him because of what he did for their ratings and their subscriptions. He's 100% right. And, and it has been the case. And they, they love anything that keeps people terrified and continuing to click or to look on. The other problem in all of this is that our media class is largely comprised of wealthy, privileged people. Uh, it, and, and I don't know if, again, your viewers know this. It costs a lot of money to live in New York City. And... To work as a journalist, and they don't get paid very much, whether it's in print or online or cable news media, you don't get paid that much. So as a result, you need to go ahead and have something that will make sure that you can pay for an apartment in New York City or keep you afloat, which means that most of the people who are there come from money. They come from privilege. As a result, they're not that interested in critiquing the institutions that are decaying. And so whenever they look around at the world, and and this is something that I think Americans really struggle with, we have a hard time recognizing what's actually going on because to look at the problems with America means looking at the narratives we tell ourselves about ourselves. Like if you are a really, really successful pundit in the New York Times or MSNBC or you name it, you're at the top of a ladder. Are you going to go around telling everyone that the ladder like is rotten? That the latter was unfair. As a result, you don't want to look at white supremacy. You don't want to look at patriarchal power. Well, you don't it's want to look at sabotaging, isn't it? This is the problem. Self sabotaging. Yeah. So we have an entire media class, and 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 by the way, uh, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions, of Americans are screaming at these people. Why do you not recognize what's happening, and why do you keep making it worse? And these people are largely uh, in their own ecosystems and bubbles. They can't reckon with what's going on, and they can't reckon with their own part in it. America loves a strongman. We hear this all the time. And Donald Trump has molded himself into that role. But in reality, is Donald Trump as strong as he likes to appear? Or is he actually terrified? Masculinity is particularly based on this projection of strength, right? And, and, and we see it in America, big trucks uh, wearing shirts that I, I and I love that Trump has obviously inspired all this, like shirts that have like pictures of automatic weapons that say, come and take them or, you know, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to fight the ATF if need be. And what it is is actually that 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 show of supposed strength. It's hiding weakness. Men are really inherently weak. They're terrified. And this is why you see the MAGA movements like, you know, facts don't care about your feelings, showing them with guns and doing all these big, you know, supposedly macho things. If you listen to Donald Trump, who they'll put on posters, uh, they'll like superimpose his head on Rambo's body or, you know, like fantasize that he's some type of warrior king or something. 
He's a soft real estate magnate from New York City who is given everything that he's ever wanted. And on top of that, he's like obsessed with like musicals, you know, and and, and tabloid gossip. Yeah. Like he's soft through yeah. and through. The entire purpose of this, the entire purpose of the MAGA movement and the authoritarian movement is to go ahead and take advantage of the weakness, particularly of men, white men, and to go ahead and have them act out in a way which is toxic, aggressive, and destructive to pretend that they're not weak, that they're actually strong. But this is why so much of what they do is, quite frankly, very pathetic. It's ironic, isn't it, that the, the word strongman, as uh, Ruth ben Gatt writes in, in, in her book, you know, hers goes from Mussolini to the present, and the present there is a whole chapter on Trump. America likes a strong man. That's how she starts the book. America likes a strong man. And it's kind of ironic that he presents himself as this kind of mobster. And and actually, he is terrified right now. That's the reason why he's spewing all this QAnon garbage on Truth Social and putting out these videos of him trying to kind of cover all bases and project all this abuse and hatred, because he's running scared. And whilst, you know, the, I wish I was more educated in, in, in mental health so that I could analyze that moment where he holds up his own mugshot and says, you know, look at this, buy this T-shirt. Because what, I mean, if there's anything going on between those ears, I, I think there must be something. You almost hear it ticking over. But, like, that is so complex to to intellectualize the idea of a man who's had this whole life in New York and being a real estate guy and not not really being in politics and then playing the role of the every man when of course the guy's a billionaire you know he couldn't be furthest from a from an every man anti-establishment but of course he's completely intertwined with the establishment Jeffrey Epstein and these you know these were his friends and then it coming to this point where he's holding up a T-shirt saying, buy my mugshot. I mean, that is a minefield of kind of psychological warfare. For those of us who analyze Donald Trump on a daily basis, I finally, in this conversation with Jared Yates Sexton, was able to get some clarity on what it is about Trump that makes us so addicted to his crazy behavior that makes us keep wanting to come back for more. People forget, like, he didn't particularly want to be president of the United States of America. He did this in order to, like, give his brand more, you know, uh, more air. He then became president of the United States, became the most talked about focused person in the world that wasn't enough for him. Uh, thankfully, right now, someone like Elon Musk is giving us just a master's class in this psychology. This is a person who has more money than nearly anybody else in the world and is miserable. And what, what we're seeing here is it is a failure of the Western mind to get what you want and then still hate yourself and still absolutely loathe who you are, which, by the way, is why Donald Trump hates his supporters, because he looks at them and he's like, how could you fall for what I do? How could you, how could you possibly come out here and believe this load that I'm giving you? And what's happening with Donald Trump is that he has gone so far deep into that performance that he can't tell the difference anymore. Yeah. It's not just chronic lying. It's an inability to tell reality from yeah. unreality. He's become a pastiche of himself now. He's actually impersonating himself at rallies that he used to do. But, you, can, right. you know, if you look close enough, you can actually see that the lights are on, but no one's home. He, he is playing the role of a, of a, of a contemptuous ex-president. That's exactly right. And I don't even think he particularly wanted to run for the presidency again. And if anybody remembers this, his first rallies, and I, I use heavy quotes around that, his first rallies when he announced his new election, he wasn't particularly into it. He looked awful. He didn't really have like any of the old energy. It wasn't until the legal jeopardy got brought into it that he's like, oh, I might need to become president in order to help myself here. Yeah. And, you know, he this is a person who has just compelled himself to live in his own fictions to the point where he cannot tell the difference between it. He is, uh, without a doubt, one of the most fascinating and terrifying individuals. I think that we hate him so much, obviously, because he's disgusting. But I think he represents the parts of ourselves that we hate the most. 
you know, that that self-dealing, the vanity, the cruelty, the abusiveness. We look at this and, and it's it's almost like, um, you know, the the painting of, of, of Oscar Wilde, you know, like it, or Dorian Gray, I guess. And, you know, you look at it and you're like, oh, my God, what's being reflected back to me is the the poison of Western culture. Like this is what the last 50 years of American capitalist culture has created. And it's so grotesque and awful. And meanwhile, you just watch it and you know that this is wrong. You know that this is sick. It's poisonous. And it, and it's it's just it's it's so repulsive and upsetting. Trump talks constantly about the deep state being the enemy of the people. But what is the deep state? Is it a real thing? And is it something we should fear or is it just the federal government doing its job? This is about calling out the administrative state and replacing them with cronies who are, one, more than happy to break the law. One of the problems with Donald Trump going into 2020 and 2021 is he didn't have enough people who were willing to break the law and destroy the Constitution for him. So what Trump and Bannon and other people around him are worried about are finding authoritarian stooges. That's what they're looking into. What the donors who created this plan and the strategy are looking to do is they're looking to have a permanent takeover of the government. They want to create, they, they, they rightly diagnose that there is a deep state. They don't want to get rid of the deep state. They want their own deep state. They want a group of people in power who are more than happy to carry out their agenda on their behalf, and they'll be beyond any elections or any sort of staffing or anything moving forward. It is a total takeover of the government by a right-wing group that has the authoritarian agenda that you and I have been talking about. And he says it out loud. You know, yes. he, he talks about it. He, he talks about this plan so very clearly. And again, the media are not covering nope. it. There, it is a total denial of the fact that you've got this guy who could win the election because the Electoral College is, is rigged in favor of him and, and Republicans, not to mention all the other work that's been going on behind the scenes with the gerrymandering, redrawing of districts and removal of polling places and all these things, yeah. little things, little, little baby steps to achieve the ultimate goal of reinstalling Donald Trump. He has said that he wants people who are politically aligned with him working in the government. It's a little bit like that period of two weeks after he lost the election in 2020 or 2019 to through, well, no, it was 2020, sorry, through to 2021, where he fired a whole bunch of senior people and replaced them with people like Jeffrey Clark, who was willing to act out the, the kind of Trump plan to overturn the election. You know, why would you need to fire people in the final two weeks of, of your presidency? Again, like, let's focus on that, that, that this was him doing that. And to all intents and purposes, a second Trump presidency will be retribution. That's a word that he keeps using. He's going to go after anybody and everybody that has wronged him, criticized him, disagreed with him, and pardon anybody that was supportive of him including Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, of which in the last few days have been receiving record sentences. I mean, this is, this is a terrifying reality. It's not something that we should be joking about. This, is, this will completely reshape the United States as we know it, and the world is looking on. No one's going to want to do business with a second Donald Trump presidency. Clearly, Donald Trump's authoritarianism is a problem. It's a problem for all Americans, not just Democrats, for Republicans who vote for him, who might not really understand the true threat of having an authoritarian back in office, because, of course, the second time will be far more dangerous than the first. And be careful what you wish for and be careful what you vote for, I guess, is the lesson here. First of all, voting is just base level democracy. Um, you know, it, we, we're basically told in the United States of America every two to four years, you go to a ballot box, you choose somebody and you walk on and that's it. Participatory democracy is much more than that. Uh, we've been sold a false bill of goods that that's all you need to do. Um, the authoritarianism and the neo-fascism that you and I are talking about here, it feeds on loneliness, broken communities and feelings of powerlessness. Uh, neoliberalism as an ideology, which is what we've been living under for the past few decades, the, the wreckage that we're dealing with right now is neoliberal wreckage. You're supposed to feel alone. 
Like Donald Trump, you're supposed to feel like all you're trying to do is screw people over. You are smart. Other people are stupid. They're there for you to take advantage of them, and that's it. We have to reform communities. We have to find other people. That way we can work with them and fight with them. I think the labor developments we've seen over the past couple of years are really, really hopeful. Yeah. But we have to rebuild these communities that have been intentionally destroyed. We have to find each other, have faith in one another, and develop a fight for a vision of the future that isn't just protecting our institutions. That's base level stuff. Like reinstating Roe v. Wade and codifying a woman's right to choose, that's, that's a starter. You know, yeah. like that, like it that, should that, be that, a that given. Sh that should be a given. Yeah. We shouldn't have to sit here and fight for gay and trans people to yeah. live or black people to vote. Yeah. That shouldn't even be an argument. We have to have our train our eyes to a horizon that's so far beyond that. We deserve better than this. And only by working together and getting involved and actually participating in democracy are we going to get there. OK. Jared, thank you. As ever, um, we will have another conversation in the future. I have no doubt. Good luck with your book, The Midnight Kingdom, which is uh, on the shelf behind you. And uh, hopefully people will uh, you know, reach out to Jeff Bezos and get themselves a, a copy of that, or hopefully directly with the publisher. Thanks again for joining The Weekend Show. Thank you so much, Anthony. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism on Patreon, patreon.com slash five minute news. Download my daily five minute news podcast. It drops every morning and join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the five minute news weekend show with Midas Touch. <laughs>